Good morning, everyone. Today, I'm going to give you the five things you need to uh, ask a realtor. You know, anyone can sell your house right now. Um, you know, with only, you know, 10% active inventory out there, yes, anybody's going to sell your house. But there's $100,000 at stake. So the difference between having the right realtor and the wrong realtor, about $100,000. Normally, it's the difference between selling your house and not selling your house. Now it's just a function of how much money are you going to make or lose, you know, with the right or the wrong realtor. So when you go on the market, let's talk about this, right? So anybody can sell your house. People, sellers shouldn't be worried about selling their house. It's going to sell, okay? But there's five things you need to ask a realtor to save $100,000 because it is not selling it that's the question. That usually was the question. Can I sell it or is it going to withdraw? 40% of the market usually withdraws, 60% usually sells. But in today's market, they're all going to sell. It's just a question of how much money are you going to get out of this? So here's five questions you need to ask a realtor. Remember this. This is a business transaction. We're not buddies. We're not friends. We're not family. We're not, you know, going out to have coffee together. It's a business transaction. You need to ask tough questions. And, and you may have parents in New York or North Carolina or wherever they are, friends, family, business associates that are trying to sell a house. They need to know the five things to ask when they're talking to a realtor. The first thing is, what's your commission structure? What exactly is your structure? You know, right now, it normally goes somewhere from 4.5% to 6%. 4.5%, 2% goes to the listing agent, 25 goes to the selling agent, all the way up to 6% where some of them are keeping three and a half percent and giving the buyer agent two and a half percent. So that's a big deal. So just explain really quickly is in real estate, a realtor, an agent who's going to sell your house has to work for a company. And that company requires a percentage of your income, whether it's because they have a big name or whether you have a multi-level marketing deal, we got to pay in to other people that brought you in or you receive a massive bonus to come work for that company, like a compass, and then you have to pay back money to the company to pay back your loan. But in any case, paying money to a broker is a waste of money. It's just a waste of money. It's throwing money down the drain that you need to use for valuable tools, okay? So, um, so Samson Properties, they don't charge their agents anything. If you're a top producer, you get 100%, goes right to selling the listing. Listing agent, assistant listing agent, and selling that property. So, you know, 6%, let's say a million dollar house, you're throwing away 15,000 bucks, okay? All right, how do you prepare the home? So this is, a lot of agents are so excited to get a listing, they don't pay attention to telling the sellers and having the hard conversation of, I'm sorry, but that wall's gray, this wall's yellow, and that wall's tan. They have to be consistent when they walk in. You have to look correctly. Your lighting fixtures are dated. You need to swap those out. It's not hard, it's not expensive, but you need to do it. You need to prepare the home for the 2021 buyer. And there's so much money at stake, so much money at stake, that the difference between doing it right and wrong, although I'll show you in a few minutes, is about 120,000 bucks, okay? So, so let's focus on uh, one of the question is, how do you prepare my house? And our answer is, we only work on cosmetic items, no capital improvements. Cosmetic items pay $7 for every dollar invested. Capital improvements, if you put in 20, you're only getting back 10. So we don't do capital improvements. So we only work on the cosmetics. We have a 30-something giving advice on what we're going to do to make it look good for a 30-something who are our buyer. Okay? So... So I don't care if, if we hurt feelings. We don't hurt feelings. We just come in and tell them how it is. This is what today's buyers are looking for. They don't want traditional. They want transitional. Now, one seller heard me talking about this and thought I was just going to trash their house because it had that you know, tan paint off. Look great. It looks fantastic. So, so really, when we come in, we really have to look at it to determine just little things to pull out of a house to turn it into a transitional look. Um, I don't like to spend money. I don't like massive work. Um, you know, that's not what we're trying to do, but you really need to prepare the house. And for somebody to say, oh no, this looks good to me. 
a listing, I will tell you, a listing just went off with yellow walls. Well, the difference between yellow walls and, and um, uh, Revere Pewter is, you know, $25,000, $35,000, and it only costs $4,000 to paint or $3,000 to paint. So um, it's wrong to not prepare a house for today's sellers. So what's the pricing strategy? So for most people, um, they go on a computer and the computer tells them what the house is worth. They take that number and say, here's what we want to list it at. Um, and they'll, they'll have a 26 page report validating that. Well, those numbers are wrong. I mean, every day when I'm pricing a home, I'll look at all the pricing models. They're all over the place. Some of them are a hundred $150,000 off from each other. So they need to price a home based on their experience and their own model that they've developed. What is the average price per square foot? Adjust it for size and age. What is the average percentage of assessment? How do those things work together? What is a customary value? What is a updated value? What is a renovated value? What is a dated value? So a realtor has to be an expert on pricing. So what is your pricing strategy that starts with what's the value of my house? How good are you at figuring that out? Okay. Now, the pricing strategy then goes to once we know that it's a customary value, let's say I'm updated and let's say it's 1.32 is a customary value and 1.35 is an updated value, right? Well, the buyer pool under 1.3 is four times bigger than the buyer pool over 1.3. So if you kept it at 1.3, you're going to get bids to 1.45. It's $150,000. If somebody says, well, let's go at 1.35 or 1.4, then it sits and they wait and then boom, 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 starts to backfill. I'm going to show you evidence of that in a few minutes. Okay. So trust me, the strategy should be, okay, here's what the customary value is listed at the customary value. And if you're close enough to a major threshold, dip under the threshold that triples or quadruples your buyer pool. <clears throat> That's a strategy. Let them bid, okay? What is your marketing plan, right? There's four things that you have to do. You have to, you know, I don't want to talk about your company and how great your company is. Your company is not going to help a seller. So if somebody's talking to you about their company, they're wasting your time, okay? You want to know what is your marketing plan? How are you going to reach the realtors with stored searches, the neighbors, the renters, and the people that are outside of your area. There should be a four-prong approach, okay? And I'll tell you what, so the people with stored searches, that's just fine. You know, that's a, that's a good solid place to start. The renters that are in the school district, that's another great place to be, right? Yeah. So what's your strategy for getting to those people, right? You wanna have the neighbors. I know people don't like having nosy neighbors. They call them nosy neighbors. Look, your neighbors are your friends. Your neighbors are your advocates. They're the ones that love the neighborhood the most and know all the benefits of it. They have family, they have friends, they have business associates that they're trying to get into that area. So do we let the neighbors know? You bet your tail we let them know. We send them out brochures. So then, you know, the last thing is the buyers that are not looking in your area. And this is the key. So we'll have, let's say three houses on the market last weekend. And we had, let's, let's say it was 25 or 30 contracts that came in. From where? Where did they come in from? Where are the buyers coming in from? Where are the biggest deals coming in? Where are the biggest numbers? Where's the biggest bids coming in from? See, we need to know that because the next three houses we're gonna put on the market have to learn from the last three markets. And we need it on every weekend because I need to still know, are these West Coast buyers? Are these DC buyers? Are these Arlington buyers? Are these Alexandria buyers? Where the heck are they coming from? Well. If people that are coming locally looking um, are bidding in the, let's just pick a number, 850 range, and I've got Arlington bidding in the 925 to 950 range, see, a person in Arlington looks at the house and goes, this is the cheapest thing I've ever seen. I'll bid on 950 because I can now telecommute and I can live in this house as opposed to that house in Arlington and I can pay 950. So where are my highest prices coming from? Okay. It's coming from feeder areas that are more expensive than we are. How, what's your plan? How are you getting them in here? I can tell you that's where all our big money contracts are coming in from. So how, what's your marketing plan 
to those four groups and listen very carefully, okay? The last question I would ask a realtor of the five questions is, do you, do you accept an escalation clause? An escalation clause allows people to bid by, you know, 2,000 or 5,000 over the highest offer. And that kind of lets buyers cheat. They can bid up like that, right? Well, we don't allow escalation clauses. And, you know, realtors don't like that. Some don't like that. And buyers don't like that. But because we're forcing them to make their highest and best offer. We want highest and best offers. We want them, you know, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, whenever the deadline is, we want your highest and best offer. So what that does is we'll find that we'll have two or three offers in here and then one offer up here. So often we'll get $50,000 in one case, $150,000 over, I was gonna say the next highest bid, but there was no other bid. When we said highest and best offer, no escalation clause, they bid 150,000 over themselves and removed home inspections and removed appraisal contingencies. So you see, if you do highest and best, and on the same weekend, we had another person doing a hundred mil road for 175,000 over their own contract. So if they allow an escalation clause, and I know they do because we're buyer agents. And the first question we have is, do you accept escalation clauses? And they'll say, sure. And one agent told us, it's only fair. It's only fair. And I got to tell you that we kind of all, you know, got a good laugh out of it, but that's, that's fair to who? I mean, you're trying to be fair to the seller. You're trying, you know, we're sellers agents. We're paid to work for the seller. So highest and best offer returns. So if you, um, the first question could save you $20,000 on a commission, right? Preparing your home. Clearly, if you invest seven thousand, you make back fifty or sixty thousand dollars. So that's a huge profit on that. How you price to get people to bid and get it up—that's very important, right? How you market to people outside of your market area and bring them in—that's the pull marketing that we're doing. Pull them into your market. That's very powerful. And then the final is the escalation clauses: no escalation, highest and best offer, so that bidding goes up and goes on. So. The last, and then the last thing you want to ask them is what's your track record? And before I had anyone come to my house, I'd say, just send me your track record of similar size, age, price range, my, my area, my town. Um, I need to know what your track record is. Just send me your houses. What are your average days on market? And what are your, what is your percentage of assessment? So if, if all houses are selling at a percentage of their assessment, the higher you can get of that assessment, the more money you just made your clients, right? So that's a really good indicator. So let's just take a look. And, and again, I'm not, I'm not um, this does not go to bragging. This just goes to what you need to do to authenticate anybody that's coming to your house, whether they're here in Virginia or in North Carolina or Maryland or wherever, right? You want to be, you want to authenticate the pricing. All right, so let me get to the next one here. So... So this is what that would look like, okay? So these are houses that are selling up in the million dollar range, million three, million four, million five. Let's say I'm going to talk to a seller that's over a million dollars. And you say, okay, well, here's all your sales and here's your days on market, right? So it's obvious whatever strategy I'm talking about is, is working fine. And again, let me just, let me, let me bring this back. This is not a Casey Sampson thing. This is a Casey Sampson team thing. Billy, Kelly, Morgan, Colby, Pat, Pam, awesome at preparing these houses, getting them ready, working their tail off to get these contracts up. And, you know, Julie does just, and Michelle do just a magnificent job in the back room, you know, marketing these things. So this is a, this is a team effort, but look at the percentage of assessments here. So the average percentage of assessment in Vienna is 124%, right? So these are sellers that did it right. You know, they prepared their house, they priced it where it should be. You know, places like Ermintrude did not want to list here. They wanted to list it higher, but they, they got 100000 over what we asked. All of them went that way. So these are the premiums that they got over list price, right? So we look, there's another page on the whole other page of them. So if we look down here, again, we're still working on, you know, the max is 10 days, right? Well, not all houses are perfect. Some take a little time. But look at the, again, the percentage of assessments and they're listening to us, okay? 
Now I had four, those 40 homes. Um, the strategy was as we planned. We just, we went through with our strategy. On four homes, the sellers chose not to go with the strategy. And again, I'm not criticizing, but what I'm saying is we all need to get, we all need to evolve. We need to get better. We need to get smarter every week. My dad always said, you're only as good as your next at bat, right? So we're only, we're only as good as, you know, learning lessons from the past. So I had four people that wanted to price it somewhere other than where we wanted to price it at, okay? Um, maybe it was 25,000, maybe they missed their threshold, maybe they didn't want to paint, maybe they didn't want to do what we asked them to do. But every time that we did that, and it was only one out of 10 would do that, we got skunked. We got 109% of assessment, 106, 116, 110. So we got less percentage of assessment, we got less premium, we sat on the market longer. So we sat on the market 26 days. And, you know, when you get into this situation, you start talking about having to deal with home inspectors, right? So the premiums for the people that kind of followed the strategy was 113. And the people that didn't follow the strategy was 12,000 negative and, you know, 131% of assessment versus 110% of assessment. So what this really, tells me is that I'm not gonna be so easy on people this year because I know that when they wanna do it at a bigger price, I didn't put up enough fight to say no, no. I'm gonna tell you, you know, you're either driving the bus in this market or you're gonna get hit by the bus. So it's either one way or the other. So we wanna be driving the bus. We don't wanna get hit by the bus. So from now on, I'm not gonna let anybody step out in front of the bus and just do it wrong. I mean, you know, you can work with another realtor if you want. I don't care, but I'll be more um, forceful because I want to win, right? I want these. I want 145s, 150s, 130s, 134s. I don't want, I don't want one tens, right? Because I'm telling you, it's it's painful to watch this happen, to watch people not make money and people sell in these numbers when you know everybody else is selling higher numbers. So, you know, that's kind of what you want to do when you're talking with with uh, the five questions you want to ask a realtor and what is your authentication? Let me have your track record so I can see whatever strategy you're going to do works. I need to see that it works. There's a lot of money at stake. This is business. This is not a friends. Shouldn't be friends, family, uncles, cousins. I don't deal with, you know, I don't do business with friends. Um, this is just a business. So, um, you know, be very thoughtful if you're going to work with a realtor. If you're going to be a seller, do it soon. Do it quick before the inventory gets out. I've just shown that we're still 15% under. Um, our inventory is 15% down from a five-year average. So now is a great time to do it. My name is Casey Sampson. You've been listening to Coffee with Casey. You can reach me at 703-508-2535 or Casey at CaseySampson.com.